With the beginning of the 20th century came an explosion of discoveries of what scientists at the time thought were to be new radioactive elements. These elements all seemed to decay into other elements, leading to even more discoveries. A race to categorize these new elements between chemists Frederick Soddy and Kashmir Fionz led to two critical discoveries in the short years to come. The first was the fionz soddy Displacement Law, developed in 1913 independently by the two, which is a law that predicts the behavior of elements undergoing both alpha and beta decay. The second is the realization that these so-called radio elements are not new at all, but different versions of already known elements. The term isotope was coined shortly after this realization. From 1913 on, radioactive isotopes were hot topics of study by physicists and chemists everywhere, but research was difficult for one main reason, availability. The only way to get a hold of such isotopes was to find them naturally through means of digging them up from the ground and extracting them from ores, making radioisotopic metals extremely rare, expensive, and difficult to obtain. This remained a challenge for two decades after the discovery of isotopes, but the issue was eventually resolved in 1934 at the hands of a husband and wife duo of French chemists by the names of Frédéric and Irène Joliot Curie. Irène Joliot Curie was born in Paris in 1897, the daughter of two immeasurably talented scientists, Marie and Pierre Curie. She was six years old when her parents won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, and the Curie name shot into stardom. Throughout Irène's early life, though, she did not see much of her parents, for they were constantly hard at work in the laboratory, and she therefore was initially raised mainly by her paternal grandfather, Eugene, until she was around six years old. When she was eight, though, her father, Pierre, was unfortunately tragically killed in a horse wagon accident, and Marie was left alone to raise Irène and her sister, Eve. Marie saw high potential in Irène in mathematics and enrolled her into a small private school that she organized herself. This so-called school consisted of six esteemed professors teaching each other's children in their fields of expertise, so Irène received quite an advanced education at a very young age. When the First World War broke out, Irène spent her time in mobile field hospitals, first with her mother in France and later by herself on the Belgian front. During this time, an 18-year-old Irène used x-rays to locate shrapnel hidden in wounded soldiers' bodies while simultaneously teaching doctors and nurses alongside her how to do the same. Irène returned to education in 1918, that same year receiving her baccalaureate in mathematics and physics that she was working towards when she was interrupted by the war. She immediately began working towards her doctorate as an assistant to her mother at the Radium Institute in Paris, which, by the way, was founded by her parents. As she neared the end of her doctorate in 1924, she was asked by her mother to train a new assistant, Frédéric Joliot, a chemical engineer and recent graduate of the City of Paris Industrial Physics and Chemistry Higher Educational Institution. The two fell in love and married in 1926. After both receiving their doctorates from the Radium Institute, they began working on all their research topics together, and they came close to scientific success multiple times before their big breakthrough. Upon gaining access to Marie's polonium, they conducted a series of experiments, bombarding elements with the radioactive source. The pair was actually the first to successfully detect both the positron and the neutron in the early 1930s, but failed to accurately interpret the results, and so credit went to others who replicated the experiments and correctly interpreted the results. Carl David Anderson for the positron, and James Chadwick for the neutron. On the cusp of scientific greatness, not once, but twice, it seemed like the Joliot Curies were destined to have some sort of revelation at some point, and it finally happened in 1934. Early into the year, Frédéric and Irène used their polonium source and decided to test its effects on naturally stable substances. They tested a number of light elements, ranging from hydrogen to phosphorus, and found some interesting behavior from three specific elements, aluminum, boron, and magnesium. They first made a significant discovery upon observing aluminum foil after they removed the polonium source from their setup, 
and found that they still detected positron emission even in the absence of the naturally radioactive material. According to the Joliot Curies, the foil itself had become some sort of radioactive product with a half-life of 3 minutes and 15 seconds. For their experiments with boron and magnesium, they noticed similar behavior. The boron becoming some radioactive product with a half-life of 14 minutes and the magnesium becoming some radioactive product with a half-life of 2 minutes and 30 seconds. At the time, they characterized these newly discovered radioactive materials as new radio elements, but also noted that these radio elements were more likely to be unstable isotopes of already known elements. Upon collisions between alpha particles and these three stable elements, transmutations would occur that would result in radioactive isotopes with two more protons and three more neutrons than started, with a neutron being ejected immediately upon collision. So boron would turn into an unstable isotope of nitrogen, magnesium into an unstable isotope of silicon, and aluminum into an unstable isotope of phosphorus. These unstable isotopes would then undergo beta decay, emitting positrons and converting a proton in the nucleus into a neutron, resulting in stable products carbon-13, aluminum-27, and silicon-30. To test this thesis further, they bombarded the chemical compound boron nitride with alpha particles from the polonium and then heated the product with sodium hydroxide, also known as caustic soda, to release gaseous ammonia. From this, they found that the radioactive behavior did not stay with the boron, but rather was carried away with the ammonia, suggesting that the new radioactive substance they had created from bombarding boron was in fact an unstable isotope of nitrogen. They underwent a similar type of method to separate aluminum from radioactive phosphorus by dissolving the irradiated aluminum in hydrochloric acid. They published their findings on these experiments in Nature in February of 1934. To say that the first artificial synthesis of radioisotopes was a big deal is an understatement. Not only did this have massive implications for research in particle physics, but also in the field of medicine. The field of radiotherapy was rather new at this time, and doctors were just starting to use radiation as a form of cancer treatment for their patients. Being able to synthesize radioactivity not only vastly sped up the process, but also made it much less expensive, making it a much more viable option for those struggling with the disease. The Joliot Curies received significant praise for their discovery, and the pair shared the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1935 in recognition of their synthesis of new radioactive elements. The Joliot Curies are pillars of scientific history and their discovery that radioactivity can be synthesized not only made research in radioactivity much more feasible, but also indirectly saved tons of lives through their impact on biomedical research. If you enjoyed this video, please consider liking and subscribing. Click here if you want to see more scientific progress made during this time period. Thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next video.